The Green Bay Packers won world championships in 1965 and 1966. Throughout summer camp in 1967, Vince Lombardi emphasized that the season ahead was going to be about making history. Coach Lombardi started from the get-go that year about winning the third consecutive title. No one had ever won three consecutive titles, and he reminded us that we had a chance to do that in 61 and 62, and that we'd fallen down in 63. In 67, the difference was he never let us forget that we were trying to win three in a row, something that had never been done before, and we'd go down in history. He kept saying we, but actually it was he. <laughs> Each year, you have different motivating features, and uh, at this particular time, uh, uh, we're going to try to repeat. <laughs> Well, it was a brutal camp. The up-downs and grass drills were so brutal. Coach uh, Lombardi had a saying, he said, the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. He also had a saying, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. You can't play fatigue. Therefore, it's up to you to be in prime physical condition. He wanted to be certain that we didn't fatigue in the middle of the season or at the end of the season. When we got ready to play a difficult ball game, he wanted to make sure we remembered July. The departure of Hall of Fame running backs Paul Horning and Jim Taylor left a huge void for Lombardi to fill. Paul Horning was just a sensational football player. And we missed Paul a great deal. And we missed Jimmy a great deal, too. Jimmy's romping, stomping fullback. But when they were gone, we knew we'd miss them. And maybe that we had to pick it up a notch or two to uh, succeed. During 1967, the search for the right backfield tandem would present a puzzle for Lombardi. Part of the solution was a 1,000 miles away at the New York Giants summer camp in Fairfield, Connecticut. Fullback Chuck Mercine, number 29, a third-year veteran from Yale, was poised for a breakthrough season. Through the first eight games of uh, the 66 season, I was in the top seven or eight in the league in rushing. And uh, even though I didn't play the last six games of my second year due to an injury, I still ended up leading the Giants in rushing. If you watched me play, you knew I, I played hard. I may not have been an elite athlete, but I was strong, pretty hard nose, ran pretty hard, and had a lot of determination. But in the summer of 1967, Marcin was concerned about his frosty relationship with head coach Allie Sherman. You're not going to beat anybody in the National League, you backs skittle-scaddling around like that behind line of scrimmage. You see a little something, and if it isn't there, you make one cut and go. You might break the tackle. That's the way you do it in this league. You ain't going to beat these babies. College, maybe. Not here. He did get on me pretty good about having come up to uh, play professional football from Yale rather than from uh, Big Ten school. There's a lot of sarcasm with him. He could be very biting. With me, of course, you know, Mercine, what do you think? You're you know, playing Harvard this week. As it turns out, all the cuts that have been made, we're ready to play our first game of the regular season. And maybe two, three days before that first game, Ali Sherman chose me to put on waivers. With his NFL career in limbo, Mercine joined the semi-pro Westchester Bulls. I was terribly distraught to, to do this, but I also knew that if I was going to stay in this game and not quit, I had to stay in shape. I knew one thing, no one could outheart me. That's the way I played the game of football. My heart was such that you know, I wasn't gonna give up ever. And uh, quitting wasn't something I was gonna think about. And if, if it meant I have to go down and play in that semi-pro league for a couple of games. I just had to swallow my pride and do it. The quest for a third straight title began at Lambeau Field. Quarterback Bart Starr, bothered by an injured right thumb, threw four interceptions. Trailing 17 to 14 with less than two minutes remaining, Starr's pass to number 22, Elijah Pitts, resulted in an 84-yard gain. Pitts set up a field goal that enabled the Packers to escape with a tie. 
This game marked a rocky start to the season, especially for guard Jerry Kramer. Lions tackle Alex Karras outplayed number 64 Kramer all day. You know, I had not one of my better days, unquestionably. And so I felt bad about it, and Coach Lombardi chewed my backside, so he let me know about it. And my son asked me about Alex Karras, and my wife asked me about Alex Karras, and my barber asked me about Alex Karras, so I'd had all the Karras I wanted. After the season, Kramer and Karras tangled again, this time in a war of words. After I had published Instant Replay, I was at a dinner with Alex Karras. Alex was speaking and I was speaking, and Alex got up in front of me and he said, Jerry Kramer is the best guard in football. If you don't believe it, read his book. So the crowd got a giggle out of that. So I got up and I said, geez, Alex, I, I appreciate the comment. Who read the book to you? Jerry Kramer was a vital part of the Packers veteran nucleus. I am Jerry Kramer. I play right guard. I've been with Green Bay for the past 10 years. I'm Max McGee, and I've been left in with the Green Bay Packers since 1954. I'm Bart Starr. I was the 17th round draft choice of the Green Bay Packers back in 1956. On Green Bay's 40-man roster, Bart Starr was among 11 players who were over the age of 30. Certainly we were aging, we were aware of that, but we still felt confident, I think, that we could play the game at a high level. Numerous injuries to Starr symbolized what many saw as the team's physical decline. Starr missed two of the season's first five games and was sidelined for most of a third. In Starr's first two starts, he threw nine interceptions. Starr had only thrown three interceptions during the entire 1966 season. After five games, the Packers were mistake-prone and still lacking backfield chemistry. An aging offense appeared to be on a collision course with trouble. Our offense was not performing. If it hadn't been for the defense, we would have been in big trouble. But we had some great defensive games those first four or five games of the season. Green Bay's defense propelled the team to a 3-1-1 one one record and the Central Division lead. In their last three games, it has been the Packers defense that has ruled completely. They have been the offense. We'd never point the finger at the offense. We knew that they were struggling. We knew they were trying to find themselves. We knew they had to find themselves. And we knew that we had to take up the slack. Willie Davis said that, you know, it's on us. If we play great defense, the worst thing could happen is a 0-0 tie. I go in every ball game figuring we're going to have a shutout. And I'm very disappointed when they score the first, and I'm even more disappointed when they score the second time on us if it happens. Dave Robinson was an outside linebacker in his fifth season. As a rookie, he first impressed Vince Lombardi with an unexpected special team skill. My rookie year, 63, is notable because that's the year that Paul Horning was suspended. And with Horning being suspended, our kicking duties fell on the shoulders of Jerry Kramer, who was fairly good on short-range field goals, but he wasn't very good at kicking off. And I happened to mention to Willie Wood, anybody should kick the ball down to the goal line, so I did it in college. And I think he told Vince, because that night Vince came over to me and said, well, Dave, he says, I've been looking at your scouting report, and I saw where you used to kick off in college. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, why aren't you kicking off here? I said, well, coach, I played offensive defensive end in college. I'm kind of at a new position, and I'm trying to practice real hard to be the best linebacker in the National Football League. And Vince turned to me and said, son, your best chance to make this team is as a kicker. So that night, I kicked 40 minutes after practice to get started kicking off. Then I used to kick off from then on. When I came into Green Bay, there were no black linebackers in the National Football League. The a AFL had them. But the NFL did not have any black linebackers. The thinking at the time was that black men weren't smart enough or sharp enough to be linebackers. In provincial Green Bay, the young man from suburban New Jersey encountered another kind of racial bias. In Green Bay especially, they had a stereotype of black folks that all black people lived in ghettos. We didn't live in a ghetto in New Jersey, not in Morristown anyway. They also had a stereotype that most black people did not have a mother and a father at home. I had both. 
During the years leading up to his All-Pro season in 1967, Robinson had re-examined some of his own preconceived notions about race. I went to Green Bay, and I picked the roster up to see what the kind of guys I was going with, and I saw all these guys from Texas, a quarterback from Alabama, fullback from Louisiana. I'm saying to myself, holy mackerel, what am I going into here? I found out one thing and one thing only. They were football players. They weren't from Alabama. They weren't from Louisiana. They weren't from Texas. They were football players. The players, they would have gone to the wall for each other. White or black made no difference. By week six, the so-called tired old men of the Packers were tired of being called old men. We started out rather haphazardly the first few games of the season. And then there was a great attack upon us by the press media that we were all old, that we were over the hill. Being an old man inferred that you were not capable of doing the job, that you had passed your prime, that you were no longer a great football player, you were a has-been, you were a bunch of old men, and it inferred that we were not capable of playing well, and it made us angry. In New York, against the Giants, Bob Skronsky in his pregame speech got up and said, I'm tired as hell about being called an old man. He said, I'm up to here with it, and I think uh, everyone else on the club was too. Number 64, all-pro guard Jerry Kramer, leads Elijah Pitts around end. Only a desperate tackle by Spider Lockhart saves a Packer touchdown. The Packers found an effective backfield combination in number 22, Elijah Pitts, and Jim Grabowski, number 33. Against the Giants, the pair combined for nearly 200 rushing yards and five touchdowns. A breakout 48-21 victory rejuvenated the old Packers. Maybe there had been a little doubt before that. Maybe we were starting to wonder ourselves whether we were old men. And so getting angry and getting that emotion up again, getting intense about the game and, and playing at that high level was satisfying. I think there was a sense of relief, a sense of joy, a sense of accomplishment after that game. Yeah, we got it. We still got it, and we can do it, and we can turn it on when we need to get it done. So we're going to be fine. Jerry Kramer enjoyed playing football because of the friendships he shared with teammates like Fuzzy Thurston. All of the Packers formed a close-knit group. We had a little tradition of the boys' night out on Monday, and we'd go out and we'd talk about things and, and have a pop or two or three or four or something like that. Anything that was a problem amongst anybody on the team would be talked about. And we'd hash things out with a beer or two, and the more you drank, of course, the more you hashed. A uh, line would say, that, that, that Bart Starr holds the ball so long, we got to hold a block for four or five seconds. Bart Starr threw 244 passes in championships, playoffs, games to determine titles with one interception. Now, do you suppose that on occasion he held the ball? It's possible. Now, we used to call him the Statue of Liberty amongst ourselves. We go downtown and meet the general public. Somebody say, boy, if Bart Starr holds that ball a long time, don't you guys have to block a long time? He'd say, Bart knows that the worst thing could happen to us is to throw an interception. I like to see Bart hold the ball rather than throw the interception. And so everything kind of came out on the table and, and uh, was kind of cleared up on those Monday night sessions. And we reduced the pressure a great deal, too. But for a team chasing history, the pressure was never completely reduced. Against unbeaten Baltimore, both Elijah Pitts and Jim Grabowski suffered season-ending injuries. The Packers lost their starting backfield and the game. The Packers owned a division-leading 5-2-1 record, but Vince Lombardi now had to find replacements for his injured running backs. During the season's ninth week, Lombardi signed Chuck Mersin. The former Giants fullback had been ready to sign with Washington when he received a call from Lombardi. 
I had the voice of God on the phone. <laughs> it was Vince Lombardi himself. And he wasn't mincing any words. He was very direct. He said, uh, have you signed with the Washington Redskins? And I said, no, sir. He said, well, you get on a plane tomorrow morning, come out here to play for us at the Green Bay Packers. We're world champions. We're going to be world champions again, and you can help us to get there. We need you, and we want you to play for us. Just like that, I said, yes, sir, I'll be there. Hung up the phone, turned to my wife and said, unpack the car. <laughs> we're not going to Washington, we're going to the Green Bay Packers, the world champion Green Bay Packers. The same, you know what to do off the 4038, I mean off the B.O.? While Chuck Mercine was learning the Packers' playbook, he won acceptance from his new teammates by proving his determination on special teams. Rookie Bob Grimm couldn't find the handle, and Chuck Mercine's recovery on the Viking 22 set up a Chandler field goal that made it 13 to 10. They've all been wonderful to me, and the acceptance uh, of myself by them has been a great uh, feeling for me. It's, I'm very grateful to them for it. This is cool. I mean, I'm going from, again, you know, you know, the lowest rung you could get to the highest rung you could get. You know, some people like to say, you know, from the outhouse to the penthouse. But Racine occasionally wound up in Lombardi's doghouse. Back crying out loud. Come on, Chuck, let's go out there! He was the kind of a person that... You know, you really didn't want to disappoint, and you did not want to let him down or disappoint him because you didn't want his anger. Come on, Machine, let's go here. You got to circle around right down the field. Machine, he can't make anything. He got to run the same, we're in trouble. Yeah, what the hell are you going to do? We got the we can't go back. No, we can't. That's all we got. Chuck Machine eventually proved that he was Vince Lombardi's kind of player. Lombardi liked the player that he could depend on. He liked the guy that would give him everything he had. He felt that a player with less than great ability who was giving him everything he had was preferable to a player with great ability who was giving him less than he had. Very good there, Chuck. That's the way. Make some mistakes, boy. It's all right. I feel good. That's fair. I'll tell you something, brother. All right. We make, we make them all, all right. Well, you're the toughest looking Yale boy I ever saw. <laughs> What'd you do with him? You, you didn't grind your teeth right. You gotta say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't expecting me to be a Jim Taylor. He wasn't expecting me to run like the wind or do something that I wasn't capable of doing. But what I was capable of doing was all he wanted and needed to get to another championship. That's what he told me, that's what he felt, and knowing that, that helped me a lot. Thanks to the 1967 draft, Lombardi already had a back who was even faster than Elijah Pitts. His name was Travis Williams. I actually didn't think I would uh, get drafted at all because of my uh, two years at Arizona State. It wasn't anything fantabulous, anything. In summer camp, Williams' speed was impressive. His ball handling was not. Travis fumbled the ball a couple times in training camp, and Coach Lombardi gave him a ball, picked it up, and said, carry this with you wherever you go. If you go to bed, take it to bed. You go to John, take it to John. You're in the shower, take it with you. It got so bad, even in the in the rookie show, the rookies presented Travis with a football, which had they taken the athletic tape and made a handle so he could carry it like a purse. <laughs> Williams has the speed to become one of the great ones in the NFL. Williams got over his fumbling problems and earned the nickname Roadrunner. He made his biggest impact on kickoff returns. In week seven, the first return of his career resulted in a touchdown. Against Cleveland, the roadrunner returned two kickoffs for scores in the first quarter. He finished the season with an NFL record four kickoff return touchdowns. In week 11 at Wrigley Field, Williams' 69-yard return set up one touchdown in a tight battle with the Bears. Bart Starr was finally pain-free. His leadership and passing accuracy helped the Packers to a win that improved their record to 8-2-1.
This victory clinched the Central Division title with three games remaining to play. At least 33 people, including a gunman, are dead and 28 injured after a mass shooting on Monday morning at Virginia Tech University. Police in Blacksburg, Virginia, said that the two shootings happened at a dormitory and a classroom on opposite sides of the campus. Former Virginia Tech quarterback Michael Vick, now with the Atlanta Falcons, added, First and foremost, I am shocked and deeply saddened about the tragic loss of life that took place early Monday on the Virginia Tech campus. My thoughts and prayers are with the families and loved ones involved in this terrible tragedy. It's my hope that the university community can pull together to help the students cope with this senseless and unfortunate ordeal. Meanwhile, Adam Pacman Jones and his representatives are expected to formally announce on Tuesday that they will appeal the one-year suspension handed down by Commissioner Roger Goodell last week. I'm Mary Strong, and this is NFL Network Now. Sixty-four hidden and caught us. They have insides and outsides, and they come. They During his come. pursuit of a third consecutive world championship, uh, we may, uh, Vince Lombardi drove his team harder than ever before. Simple offense. Come on, move out, move out, move out. Oh, come on, come on here. It's all over again. He did have a saying: uh, the big push, and he he said in training camp that year. All right. Get yourself ready. we got a lot of work to do, and this is the beginning of the big push. Now, I want everything you got. I want every ounce of your energy. I want it all. So we would double our efforts or whatever we had left we would give to him, and we'd get through the exhibition season and into the first game or so of the regular season, and he'd say, okay, this is the beginning of the big push. Now, I really want you guys to give me everything you got, and we're starting right now. This is a big push, and then we're halfway through the season. Now, okay, we start the big push here. This is a big push. At the time, it was, whoa, what, what, how much more can we take? How much more can we give you? Well, you've got it all. There isn't anything left. There isn't anything left to push with. We've already been big pushing all we got. That's the best one right there. That was the best one right there. On Monday nights, when we were out having a beer, Fuzzy would say, all right, boys, this is going to be the big push. This next drink is the big push. What are you doing out there? What the hell's going on out here? Everybody grabbing out there. Nobody tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. Coach wanted things done perfectly. You don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. And so every play had to be executed perfectly. Come on, Fleming, get off the ball hey. down the field. Hey. Henry Jordan had a great line about Vince Lombardi when asked, how did he treat you players? And Henry Jordan said he treated us all the same, like dogs. I'll tell you something, Leroy, you're not going to get your job back unless we get a better performance. Hey, it's supposed to be a hell of a defensive club. It didn't look like it to me. Oh, God. Hey, get him out of there, will you? 67 was a very, very tough year for Coach Lombardi. It reminded me of a, a president of the United States who comes into office as a young man, and you can literally see him age as the months pass. He gets older, he gets grayer, he gets a little haggard, a little drawn. Coach Lombardi got that away during 1967. It looked like the season took a tremendous toll on him. Let's go now, a little life out here. Let's have a little life out here. We look like we're half dead out here. Let's move a little bit. The Packers finished the regular season with a 9-4-1 record as they lost two of their last three games. The flat finish was a sign of Lombardi's fatigue. But the playoffs re-energized Lombardi. Before the Western Conference Championship game, he delivered an inspirational speech that set the tone for the entire postseason. He based his whole pregame speech on run to win. I believe it was St. Paul's epistle. I'm not in the habit of quoting the scripture or gospel, but I was groping, I think, at the time for something in order to give my club a little bit of a lift. And there is a quote from St. Paul. Don't you know 
that while all the runners in a stadium are in a race, only one wins the prize. So run to win. And he went on to expound on that and say that we play not just to be playing. We're here not just to be here. That's not enough in itself. We play to win. We run to win. not only ran to win, they ran over the favored Rams. The final score for the Western Conference Championship game, the Packers 28, the Rams 7, Whatever happened to all of those supposedly old men on the Packer roster? Well, Al, I guess you would have to say all of our so-called old people all came through with flying colors. And of course, young people mixed in with these so-called old people. That gave us a rare blend of perfection for this ballgame. Run to win proved to be a powerful theme that was about to be tested in an epic championship battle. On one of the coldest days in the history of Green Bay, Wisconsin, the NFL championship game was destined to earn a legendary nickname, the Ice Bowl. It was a total shock to wake up, have my alarm radio go off, and have a sound in my ear saying, it's 13 below zero. We find later on that the chill factor is minus 49, I think, at the start of the game, minus 57 at the end of the game. Ah, it's cold! The feeling of the air, it was like being in a meat locker. You, you know, you can only get so cold. And that was as cold as I'd ever been in my life, and I think anybody ever been. If you looked in the stands, all you saw was that steam coming out of people's mouths. You can only hardly even make out faces. Vince told us before the game, he said, I don't mind the offensive and defensive linemen wearing gloves, but I want the running backs, receivers, linebackers, or defensive backs to wear gloves. So everybody's going up moaning and groaning. And I went up to the equipment man, I said, I said Dominic, I said, uh, give me a pair of brown gloves. He'll never know the difference. The first play of the game was almost a disaster. Donnie Anderson fumbled. You know, it was like trying to hold an ice cube, but the ball came out. Thank God I recovered it. The referee blew the whistle. The next thing happened was he tried to pull the whistle, which was a metal whistle, out of his mouth. It stuck to his lip, and he had to rip it out of his mouth, and his lip bled, right? It cracked his lip, and the blood froze. And from that moment on, there was never another whistle in the ice bowl. We played the entire ice bowl listening to the commands of the referees saying, stop. And everyone did. Right, right here. Come here, coach. Come on. Yes, sir. You're not defensively. They don't seem to be coming off the ball. Maybe 53 and 52. See? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. The Packers took a 14 to nothing lead on a pair of Bart Starr touchdown passes to Boyd Dollar. But Starr was sacked eight times. In the second quarter, Dallas scored on a star fumble. At halftime, the Packers' lead had dwindled to four points. Field conditions were steadily deteriorating. By halftime, the field crusted over. And in the second half, that crust kept getting thicker and thicker. And it was just a rock-solid field. Conditions worsened dramatically. The footing was so bad, and the, and the hands were so cold, and the receivers catching the ball was difficult. So one score could make a big difference. And that uh, score of rentals was uh, like a knife in the heart. Dallas took a fourth quarter lead on a 50-yard pass from Dan Reeves to Lance Rensel. At this point, the Packers' offense 
didn't seem capable of playing catch-up. We've really struggled offensively in the second half. On 10 series, on 31 plays, we gained a minus nine yards. So we were getting our tail kicked in the second half. I certainly had a little, little sinking feeling that maybe this was not to be. With 4.50 remaining, the Packers faced their biggest push of the season. The end zone was 68 yards away. The temperature was 16 below zero. I don't know if anyone knows what it is you find when you reach down inside for something and you have to make it happen. But certainly, we remembered July. We remembered the training camp, remembered the hard work, the sweat, the tears, the pain, the suffering, the whole package. We remembered that. And certainly Lombardi's ability to push us to our limits helped us in that situation because this was a situation that needed everything we had, each and every one of us. What the Packers had were the values that Lombardi had preached for nine seasons. Pride, courage, and determination. brutal conditions and Dallas's bruising doomsday defense, the Packers put together a march of mythic proportions. Third down with no timeouts left, Lombardi decided to go for the win on one final play rather than settle for a field goal. The call was 31 wedge, a running play designed for the fullback. But Bart Starr didn't tell his teammates he was going to keep the ball himself. Here are the Packers, third down, inches to go. Debater, 17 to 14, Cowboys out in front. Packers trying for the go-ahead score. Star begins the count. Takes the snap. He's got the quarterback. He's got the The drive epitomized the sheer force of Lombardi's will. It also showcased the fierce determination of cast-off back Chuck Mercine. He took me aside before that game and he said, Chuck, this is why he brought you here. This is why you're here. You're starting this game. It's your first championship game. We know what you can do. Just do what you can do. And you'll help us to win this game. On his finest day as a pro, Racine gained 34 of the drive's 68 yards. I had a first down run right away there, and I remember Lombardi saying, good run, Chuck. You know, because it was right at the bench, right there. What a feeling. You can take a player like a Chuck Racine. I can tell you how tall he is. I can tell you how much he weighs. I can tell you how fast he is but no one can measure his heart, and he was all heart. Mercine believed he was going to get the ball on the game's climactic play. Everyone else did too. But Jerry Kramer claims he knew Bart Starr's secret. Chuck thought he was gonna get the ball. There isn't any question about that. Maybe Bart 
said it as we broke the huddle. He said to me, I'm going to keep the ball. I maintain that I never heard him say that. And I don't know anybody in the huddle that did. Uh, I, I know a lot of guys in the team thought I did score the touchdown. I heard the Brown Wright 31 wedge on two. And I'm ready. I'm going in. Looks like I'm signaling a touchdown, but I'm actually trying not signal the referee that I'm not assisting, aiding, or pushing quarterback into the end zone. And I would not have done that, you know, if I didn't think I was going to get the ball. Jerry Kramer made the most famous block in NFL history when he got down low and pushed number 75, Jethro Pugh, out of the way. Starr followed Kramer into the end zone. broadcast that we've done for the Green Bay Packers, but we've never taken it down to the wire like this for an NFL championship. Coach, we're going to have a play right now. You can see it on this monitor. I hope I can see this it. This is slow motion now as Jerry Kramer makes a key block for Bart Starr on this quarterback sneak for the winning yes. touchdown. They ran the play and Coach says, Hey, way to go, Jerry. Way to go. When I think of my team, the Green Bay Packers, I think of that drive. I don't think of the final touchdown, the, the sneak. I think of the drive. I think of the 68 yards. That team went in incredible conditions and how that team was able to reach down and find something that Coach Lombardi had given them and had given them over a long period of time from training camp many, many, many sessions of mental toughness, of the perfectly disciplined will, of fatigue makes cowards of us all, of all those things that he spoke of for so many years. I think they were personified in that final drive. With a history-making third consecutive NFL championship secured, the importance of Super Bowl II was a matter of opinion. Everything we had done leading up to it would be meaningless if we lost the Super Bowl. The main thing was we won three NFL championships, and we won the Ice Bowl. The Super Bowl was anticlimactic to the nth degree. In Florida, the Packers were less concerned about the outcome of the game than they were about the future of their head coach. Coach had mentioned on Wednesday, prior to the Sunday Super Bowl, that this might be our last time together. And we looked at one another and, what is that about? I think I looked at Bart and I said, what do you think that means? Well, I don't know, Jerry, it's going to only mean one thing. And so we kind of thought that maybe it meant that he was going to retire. He was kind of depressed, it looked like, to me. And uh, had his head down a lot. And wasn't real fiery or enthusiastic. Even his speech before the game, I thought it was... Kind of wrote. Before the opening kickoff, Lombardi and his team seemed unemotional. But Ray Nitschke, number 66, displayed passion and power on the game's very first play. It was no surprise that the NFL's number one defense followed Nitschke's lead throughout the game. But it was surprising that Lombardi chose number 36, Ben Wilson, to start at fullback instead of Chuck Mercine. It was completely shocking to me that five minutes before the kickoff, he said, he said, I just have a hunch Ben's gonna have a good game because he's all warmed up and he hasn't played in weeks and this is his kind of weather and you're kind of banged up. Well, I was upset. I was very disappointed. My mom and dad were there. Wow. I can't believe I'm not starting in the Super Bowl after these last two games I just had. But you can't really question Lombardi. You know, everything he did was right. He was a hunch player. Ben had a good game. Wilson was the leading rusher in Super Bowl II. Mercine carried the ball one time for no game. Oh, All right, let's work out there. Let's work out there now. Despite a 62-yard scoring pass from star to Boyd Dollar, Green Bay was less than dominant in forging a 16-7 halftime lead. The Packers might have been unfocused, but Jerry Kramer put things into perspective. At halftime, 
I said, let's play this 30 minutes for the old man. I said, look, we got 30 more minutes this year. I said, let's give it to the old man. Let's play the last 30 for the old man. Throughout the second half, the old man watched his old men methodically take apart the Raiders. The defense had the final say. A 60-yard interception return by number 26 Herb Adderley secured the Packers' second straight Super Bowl route. There's that wonderful, wonderful picture of him looking at me and it's uh, like mutual admiration. All of arguments, all of difficult times together and all of his driving and demanding and everything had finally paid off for me and I finally understood him and there was that wonderful emotion passing between us. And he looks down and he says, let's head for the locker room, boys. This was Lombardi's last victory ride. Three weeks later, he resigned as head coach. In the locker room after the ice bowl, it was pretty, how would you say, not as celebratory as you would think. The desk guys were exhausted, you know, and frozen. But after the Super Bowl in 80 degrees weather, you'd think that people would be elated. There was no elation. It was quiet. It was like funereal. And that's because we knew he was gone. Back in Green Bay, fans hailed their hometown heroes. But it would be nearly 30 years before the Packers returned to a Super Bowl. 1967 marked the end of an era in Green Bay and the beginning of a turbulent period in American society. Did you see the ball game today? Yes, I did. What'd you think of it? Real nice. How long have you been home on leave? For 30 days now. Where are you going after this? Vietnam. They got a good chance to see your Packers come back with a big win, huh? That's for sure. Are you happy? Right. Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> You knew that he, he was a great man, and, and he was, and uh, it was my privilege to play for him. That man had the distinct ability to just pat you on the head or, or give you a hug or something and make you feel like a million bucks. He didn't pay you a million bucks, so he had to make you feel like a million bucks. He would expand your athletic talent, he would expand your abilities, and also he would expand your life and your horizons and what you could do and what you could be. And so he had a tremendous impact on me and on my life and still does today. There are standards that you live by. If you're gonna do something, you don't do it right once in a while, you do it right all the time. He did a magnificent job of coaching that 67 he emphasized our strengths, downplayed our weaknesses. He made us believe. He made us all believe. Anybody had any doubts, he made us believe that we could win. No one could beat the Green Bay Packers. We just knew that. Don't you know that while all the runners in the stadium are in a race, only one wins the prize. So run to win. Additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game.